I appreciate the chance to uh, speak to you today, and I applaud the uh, University of Arizona for doing this. It's an absolutely fantastic workshop. I uh, yeah. wish we thought of it. Uh, hey, you, a few times you hear people talk about Creole, and you probably think, well, what the heck is Creole? Uh, so, Creole, uh, well, you see an outline there. Creole stands now for Center for Research in Education in Optics and Lasers. Actually, this founded in 1987, so all 30 years ago to the day, certainly to this week, uh, Professor M.J. Swallow became the first member of the, and first director of Creole and showed up in uh, Central Florida. And so we're, we're pretty new. I guess for a lot of you, 30 years sounds like a, a long time, but uh, in terms of the age of a, 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 an optics program, it's really not that old. Uh, it actually stood for Center for Research in Electro-Optics and Lasers, but uh, MJ decided that uh, one of the first things he did was to change the name of Creole to Creole, but uh, where Creole st stood for Education in Optics and Lasers rather than just Electro-Optics and Lasers. Um, gradually we grew, and I'm not going to give you the whole story, but in uh, 2004 we became the College of Optics and Photonics. So that's a very brief history of who we are. Uh, let's talk about who we are now. Let me see if I can work this. Unfortunately, there's not a remote, so I have to stand here. Okay, so currently we have 34 faculty in the college. We, we're called a college. It's kind of like the, the, the college here. We're a single department within the college. So we recently grew quite a bit. We have 34 uh, tenured and tenure track faculty. We have 17 joint faculty. These are people who uh, have some sort of position in the college, but they have their tenure in uh, other departments, mainly physics, material science, and electrical engineering. Uh, we've got a number of, uh, with about 37 PhD level research scientists, and we always have, currently 25, but that number changes, uh, a number of visiting uh, scientists. Um, our PhD program is decent size. It's actually quite a bit smaller than, than here. We have 103 PhD students currently. Uh, each year we graduate about 20 uh, PhDs. Last year the number was 18. Uh, we have 27 master's students. Uh, so our master's student uh, population is quite a bit smaller than uh, for the PhD. And uh, last year we had 24 master's degrees. So that, that makes it look like uh, the master's students only take a year to finish. They, some of them do, but most of them take longer. But there's also PhD students who get their master's along the way. So they're counted as a degree, but not as a, as a student uh, in the master's program. Uh, we now have a bachelor's program. I'm going to talk about that at the end. Currently, uh, this number is about out of date. I think we have over 120 bachelor's students right now. Um, just to give you an idea, last, uh, in the last year where we did the complete count, uh, we had 171 journal papers, nine patents, and $17 million of external funding. Our patent production is typically about 15 to 20 patents per year. It was a little bit lower in that particular year. Now, Creole was formed partly because of the reasonable, str reasonably strong industry in optics and lasers in the area. We currently have uh, 62 industrial affiliates. And uh, about $2 million of our funding comes from industry. Uh, and in our building, we have five incubated companies. So small companies that are just starting, often developing technology that was, uh, came out of the research labs. And we have space in our building that those companies can grow uh, or fail. Either way, they, they're out after a couple of years. They, they, they don't stay there permanently. So we have a pretty strong industrial link. Here's some of the companies that were formed either out of, uh, well, all, formed out of research going on at Creole. Some of them were formed by our faculty. Others were formed by students or collaborators who licensed the technology. So I won't spend long on that, but there's quite a few companies have spun out. Some of them are doing pretty well. Some no longer exist. This is the nature of small companies. But we are reasonably entrepreneurial. I'll talk briefly about, before I talk about the actual PhD program, I'll talk a little bit about the research. Now, 
PhD students are the people who do most of the research I'm going to be talking about. Master students do some of it, but master students mo mostly do coursework and just a little bit of research. Um, you could divide up our research into categories. You could pretty much slice it up however you like. Uh, our current dean, Baha Saleh, decided to slice it up into five areas, which have a strong overlap. We're very strong in the area of lasers and uh, also in optical fibers, and naturally we do a lot of fiber lasers. We grow fibers, uh, or you don't grow them, you pull them. Uh, but uh, we, we fabricate fibers, and we have a very good uh, fiber fabrication facility. We also do a lot of work in integrated photonics, and uh, additionally, in nanoscience and, and nanophotonics, um, and the, the other area where we do a lot is in sensors, imaging, and display, particularly in liquid crystal displays, we've got uh, a lot of strength. Now, you don't see biophotonics in any of those, but we do quite a lot of biophotonics. It's just mixed into these different uh, uh, research areas. I'll talk, I'm not going to talk about all of these. You've been hearing a lot about research uh, throughout the day, but I'll, I'll just throw in a, a couple of things. Um, we do have strength in lasers. Lasers is the L in Creole. Uh, even the, the old version and the new version. Uh, the, the, the main reason that Creole got started because it was a strong laser industry. And uh, we do quite a lot in laser material growth, particularly in ceramics. Uh, we do a lot in uh, laser, uh, laser produced plasmas, fiber lasers, laser power uh, combining. And uh, Eugene talked about the shortest uh, laser pulse of 67 uh, attoseconds, and that's uh, in the IFAST. Uh, laboratory in Creole. So it gives you an idea of the sort of thing that's going on. So probably if there's one major research area, I would have to say it, was, it would be lasers. That's our sort of primary area. But in fibers, we're doing a lot. We have two fiber towers. One is a two-story tall uh, fiber draw tower, and that's used for high temperature uh, materials, which it means uh, mainly silica. So we can pull uh, all sorts of fibers from that. Uh, there's a shorter one that's used for low temper and, or soft materials. And uh, there's a lot of different things that we can make. We're now uh, installing a facility uh, for making the preforms for fibers. So basically, uh, it, it's pretty miraculous how, you, you, how fibers work. You, you make a preform, which is maybe a, a, a cylinder like this, and it'll have a high index piece of glass in the middle and lower index around it. And you draw this thing that's uh, maybe a couple of feet long to kilometers, and the profile shrinks down, but it remains pretty much the profile that you started with. So uh, it's pretty miraculous to me that you do this drawing process and you don't actually change the profile much. Um, well, that's when it works, of course. Um, I want to talk about this one. This is Professor Aberati, who does a lot in polymers and soft material fiber growth. And this is, uh, I like this one because it's an example of turning failure into success. So what they found is uh, these materials are difficult. Drawing any kind of fiber is difficult. And what they find is when they're, you basically uh, get two different kinds of material, a cladding and a core. and you pull it. Well, what they found is that in a lot of circumstances, when you draw it, instead of getting a contiguous core, it breaks up into droplets. And, you know, this, is the, this, this can happen. And this shows somewhat irregular. But sometimes they find that there's some really quite regular patterns. And this is all to do with the surface tension. If the surface tension is too strong, it tends to form a ball. Now, this is exactly the same thing as if you're running the faucet. And as you, the, as you turn down the faucet, you, yeah, the, the stream of water gets narrower and narrower, and eventually it breaks up into droplets. This is called modulation instability. So Professor Aberati realized that. He knew that this was the same sort of phenomenon. But it turns out we have an expert in modulation instability when it comes to... Uh, uh, propagation of light, and that's Dimitri Christodoulides. And they got talking together, and they started looking at the equations, and they realized that this is something that can be controlled. And if you get uh, this thing really well controlled, you can make pretty much perfect spheres, 
or you can make rods where the rods are all almost exactly the same length. And what they found is that if you do this and then wash away the cladding material, you have a way of making nanoparticles. And the interesting thing is you can control the size of these nanoparticles extremely well. And now uh, you can dope them so they're fluorescent. And now they have a very large contract from, uh, I'll say it's Sherwin-Williams, but I might be wrong, a large paint manufacturer because they see this as a method of producing uh, new kinds of pigments for paints. All came out of failure. So never... Never just throw away your failures. Think about them because sometimes you can make really neat stuff. It's when things, when things happen that you don't expect in your research that you discover new things. Um, there's a lot in imaging sensing and displays, liquid crystals. Uh, I, I, I like this one. This is, it doesn't show very well here, but uh, Professor DeGarry does a, a lot on uh, microreology of liquids, and he's developed a new technique for measuring in situ the properties of blood, whether or not it's about to coagulate. And when people do dialysis, apparently every now and then they have to stop the dialysis and test the blood, and that takes time. Yeah, they now have a real-time monitor, and the students are going into Florida Hospital actually testing this on patients now. And they can, they can real-time uh, check the, the properties of the blood. I probably don't know the correct words, but then they can add coagulants or decoagulants to keep that stable and speed up the whole process. That's pretty neat. So now some of our PhD students are actually doing stuff with patients in the hospitals. So that's an example of the research. But I was asked to talk about uh, our graduate programs, and I'm sure you're interested in graduate programs. And uh, there's a lot of commonality between programs. Here's our uh, PhD curriculum. I'm going to throw all that up at, at once. I had it on a bunch of different slides, and I thought, well, what, what's in a PhD program? And it's, I think, from what I've heard, it's pretty similar here. There's you, you, you come in in the first year, you'll do a core set of courses. Sometimes there are choices. In our case, we have a fixed core. There's five courses that everyone takes. And all of these courses, except the laser engineering, are in what's called a qualifying exam. And at the end of 12 months, the students have to sit a qualifying exam. And if they pass, they go on. And if they don't pass, they get another chance. And most of our students pass after the, the second attempt. And then they will continue. In the second year, you'll continue doing uh, electives. There's quite a lot of elective uh, coursework. We have a strong laboratory course requirement as well as uh, 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 regular uh, lecture courses. Um, but students really start to get heavily involved in research, uh, sometimes in the first year, but definitely in their second year. And by the time the second year is over, most of the coursework is done, and the PhD is mainly research. And you start off pretty much doing what your advisor tells you, and you get out when you're telling your advisor what you're going to do. And that's pretty much how it works. You become an independent researcher. There's also some hours you take for research and so on, but it doesn't really matter. The main thing is you've got to get through your coursework, your qualifying exam, uh, do well in your research, and write a dissertation. And that's pretty much how, uh, how it goes. I think it's how it goes here, how it goes everywhere. We spent many, many months, years, discussing what the content of the qualifying exam should be and so on. But in the end, uh, if I'd showed you our previous uh, core coursework, it would have pretty much looked to the, the same to you. Um, we have a large number of elective courses. I'm not going to go through this, but it, it, no matter what research area you're in, there's a large number of courses to choose from. Uh, so as a, oh, well, this is, this is what I said about the timeline. Students come in in the first year. Almost all of our students are funded in the first year. So uh, while they usually have some association with the research group, they're mainly doing coursework. Uh, it, but in the second year, this is the transition year. The coursework tapers down. The research uh, ramps up. And in the, uh, the third year, we encourage students to do a research proposal and uh, continue their research. We like people to finish in five years. The average time to graduation is about five and a half years. So, and with averages, you know, there's quite a few people finish in three years. Uh, usually, those, those are people with military funding, and they have to finish in three years, and they work hard and they, they get it done. And then there's other people who, you know, take a little longer. So, uh, funding. Uh, I mentioned most students who come into our program uh, either come with some 
uh, funding from their government if they come from another country, uh, or they will get funding directly from our different fellowship programs. So most of our students are funded uh, completely with their stipend, tuition, and fees, uh, 100%. If students don't uh, qualify, some students are maybe good enough to get into the program, but, but they, we haven't, they haven't proven to us that they're good enough to get funding. Some people come and they, they prove themselves, and if they do well in the first semester, they'll usually pick up funding in subsequent semesters. The first year is usually on fellowship. Now, there are some fellowships that will continue for multiple years, but most students are funding a research, associate, uh, research assistantships after that. So, uh, and that's usually how it works. So, most of the recruiting, I mean, students will apply in general to the program, but most students, they don't just apply to the program anymore. They apply to a program with one or two particular faculty in mind that they want to work for. And I've noticed over the years, it used to be students would just come to the program, and then uh, in the first year, they would decide who they want to work for. But now, people are much more focused, and they know what research is going on. They know who they want to work for. So if you're ever looking for a program, uh, it's good to apply to the program, but usually I would recommend you talk to the individual faculty that you're interested in working for and find out if they're going to have positions in their group because, you know, if, if you go to a program and uh, it's a good program, but the faculty that you particularly want to work for are not recruiting students that year, it may not work out so well for you. So usually it's very focused, and the faculty are now very, very involved in the recruiting process for that reason. Um, anyway, so that, that, that's pretty much how that works. Um, students publish a lot. Uh, this just, uh, it's kind of a complicated graph. This is just the, 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 out of the students who graduated last year and the year before, this is, these are the number of publications and the number of conference papers they had. So this is basically saying no students graduated with no, no publications uh, or one Three had two publications, you know, seven had three to five, four had six to ten, and so on. So you, you, you get the idea. There's, there's two students last year, three students the year before graduated with more than 15. This is less than 15, but the person that did the, the slides uh, wasn't so good with their uh, algebra. So uh, anyway, so some of our students actually publish a, a, a huge amount, but we do like our students to publish a few papers before they graduate. And that depends on the, the actual discipline. So that, that's the, how the PhD works in general. Now, the, uh, the master's program uh, is something that we've been growing over the, the past few years. Um, the master's program we have figured out can be done in as little as 12 months, although most students prefer to take a little bit longer to do that. Uh, we've recently changed, we used to just have a general master's degree, which meant students could more or less choose whatever they want to take. Uh, we still have a general degree. There's three core courses, which is electromagnetic optics, scalar optics, and laser engineering. But all the electives are pretty much open. Students can do this. Uh, uh, a lot of working students do this. They'll do it part-time. They'll take some uh, classes over uh, uh, the Internet. Uh, they'll show up for some classes. Um, other students do it full-time in class. Then we have two tracks, uh, a photonics track and an optics track. And these are different in emphases, but these are very much prescribed. There's very few electives in this. Once you come into these, uh, these programs, you pretty much are prescribed the coursework that you'll take. There's room for a couple of uh, electives. These tracks require students to do either a thesis or a research report. And part of the reason for that is we had a lot of people from industry and they'd come, out, they'd come through and they'd take courses and they would comment at the end, well, was, yeah, this was a great program, we really liked it, but we feel bad because this is a great place to do research and we never did any research. So now, at least if they're doing these tracks, they have to do at least a research report. A research report is a little bit shorter than a thesis, but at least gives people a chance to work in a research group for some time. So that's how that works. Um, here's the employment 
uh, I, I didn't, uh, I'll mention some of the, the companies that students uh, uh, go to work for. This, this is, these are uh, of surveys where people, where we know where people went. Uh, about 16% of our PhD students uh, are in some sort of faculty position, either in the U.S. or in uh, uh, other countries. Uh, some in research institutes, some in uh, four-year uh, colleges. Uh, but fully two-thirds of students are in industry. So if you look at that, if you compare the master's and the PhD, sure, there's more master's students go to industry than, than PhD, but uh, even PhDs, most of the PhDs go to industry eventually. Now, something that's not factored in here is a lot of people do postdocs, and people who are thinking of continuing the research career may do a postdoc. Some of them continue to do uh, they'll, they'll continue to get a, a, an academic position, and they'll be in faculty. Others will go to government labs or industry. We didn't, I didn't put those in there because the postdoc is still kind of a continuation of the education, and we don't quite know where they go. So in this data, I actually extracted the people who are still in postdocs, so we don't know where they will go. Um, but about, about half of the people who do postdocs end up in faculty positions. Government means uh, Department of Defense or National Labs, and then other... Who knows? You know, there could be lots of, uh, there's lots of different opportunities for people. Uh, now, if you look at the masters, you know, the, 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 the people who are faculty, there's few people who are faculty, usually they are in, uh, in uh, four-year or two-year colleges, uh, not generally, not, not in, in research uh, 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 institutions. Uh, most people go to industry, government, and so on, the same. So, if you look later in life at the people who did masters and the people who did PhD who are in industry, there's probably not a big difference in how their careers have gone. Uh, if you want to get an advanced degree to make money, then getting a masters is probably the best thing to do. The PhD starting salary is a little bit higher, but if you go to industry and as it, with a master's degree, and stay in industry for three, four years when you could have been doing a PhD, you'll earn quite a lot of money in that time, and your salary will go up, maybe almost to the point of a starting PhD salary. So uh, a lot of students who feel that they just want to make money, they're, they're quite happy to take a master's uh, and leave and go to industry, and that's probably the best thing to do. The reason you do a PhD is for the love of doing the PhD. Uh, it does open up future career possibilities that you don't have with a master's, but most of the people end up in industry anyway, but maybe they just had a really good time doing their, their PhD in any case. So uh, what, what I found is uh, that the people who hire our graduate students uh, is very broad and varied, but what, what we're finding in the last few years and this isn't true of new graduates, but also some of our previous graduates are changing jobs, and they tend to be moving to a lot of the larger companies. Intel is now hiring uh, a large number of our students. Apple, for, particularly for the displays, uh, the, the people who work in LCD displays are pretty much getting picked up by Apple, but also, uh, also Google. Uh, but Intel is working in a lot of different areas. There's a lot of silicon photonics work going on. But there, there's, an, there's a part of Intel in uh, Oregon where they do lithography uh, prototyping and design. And uh, our, a lot of the students who really like to do numerical stuff end up there. And there you're basically trying to figure out complex diffraction codes, how to get another nanometer of resolution out of a system. It seems to me like for me, kind of a boring job, but a hugely impactful job. Because just think of the millions or billions of people who are ending up using or being impacted by the products that you're making. So uh, I have actually no idea what time it is. So yeah, OK. So I'll, I'll, I'll zoom through this. Yeah. I just want to talk briefly. We never had a bachelor's degree in all of our 30 years until the past few years. Now, some of us 
wanted to have this bachelor's degree, but some didn't. And we were doing pretty well without it. And uh, uh, we had a strong program, and people were happy. And so there, there was always a strong debate as to whether or not we should do it. Some people wanted to, some didn't. Uh, then we got a new dean in 2009, Baha Saleh came in. And he actually wanted to do it. And so what happened was he said, well, for the faculty who want to do it, let's do it. And for the faculty who don't want to do it, you can continue teaching and graduate. Of course, it, does, it did impact us uh, completely. But nevertheless, we offered uh, this, we're now offering this degree. Uh, it's a degree in photonic science and engineering, and it's offered jointly between our college and the College of Engineering. And that's pretty much the same as the model here, and that's not a coincidence. Um, why did we do it? Well, uh, I think we did it, from my perspective, we did it because we thought it was a good idea. But the data says that nationally there's room for 1,600 new uh, photonics engineers every year, which is a huge number. Of course, there are, we're not graduating that many, so what's happening? Well, of course, uh, electrical engineers are filling those positions. Uh, Florida photonics industry it's, itself is pretty large and can absorb all the students that we graduate, and that's what our state government cares about. So anyway, uh, I'll, I'll skip forward. Uh, I probably won't talk much about this. This is pretty much, it's quite different from the program here. It's very much close. It's a photonics program, and that's by design. It's very closely related to electrical engineering uh, in the early years. They take a lot of the electrical engineering core courses and then a lot of uh, the photonics core courses. There's a heavy emphasis on labs. And of course, as always in an engineering program, uh, they take a senior design. So there was one small thing I wanted to just touch on, and that's writing across the curriculum. When we started the program, we thought, well, students need to learn how to write. So we'll give them a lot of writing assignments in the laboratories. Of course, they have senior design. They have to write a report. And we have another course, Frontiers of Photonics, where they do a lot of uh, reading, writing, and public speaking. But what we found is that they never got better at doing writing. As they wrote lab reports, they were given lots of lab reports, and they didn't really get all that good at it. And so some of us enrolled in a UCF program, which is called Writing Across the, the Curriculum. And they helped us analyze our program and look at how students were doing. And we learned a few things about research in this area. And writing is divided into two kinds of, according to them, two kinds of uh, assignments. High stakes or formal and low stakes or informal. And everything we did was high stakes. You must write this long lab report. Uh, we'll give you an essay to write. You've got your senior design report. You've got your frontiers of photonics reports to write. And very rarely did we just ask them a question as a homework or an in-class question where you have to write two or three sentences to explain what you know. Now, one of the things that they emphasized in this writing across the curriculum uh, is that you don't really think clearly until you start to write down your thoughts. And so the idea is to reduce the amount of formal writing where students are thinking, well, how many pages do I have to fill? And they'll find a way to fill it. And instead, get people to write uh, as a way to organize their thoughts. So what, what, we, uh, uh, what we did is we started asking more questions, at least some of us, not all the faculty have bought into this yet, but some of the faculty are starting, instead of asking, uh, solve this equation, it's, you ask, well, what happens in this problem if you change such and such a parameter? What happens if you change the focal length of a lens in this imaging system? What would be the consequences of that? What happens if you move this aperture? So that you can start thinking about and writing what the consequences would be, rather than just solving the equation and saying this will be the answer. And when we do this, we don't care about the grammar uh, or even the, sorry, the spelling, but the quality of the logical arguments. And then the other thing is students never learn. At some point, students do learn. Grad students eventually learn to write drafts. But usually what happens in undergraduate labs is they have to write a report, and they'll start at the beginning, and they'll write and write and write till they get to the end. And then they might tweak a couple things. But nobody ever has taught them to write a draft. So 
in that case, you just write down what are the major things, and you write them in any order, and you, then you think, well, here are the main things I want to write about. Now what order am I going to put them in? And now uh, let me flesh that out into a full report. So now what we do in the labs is we give students small writing assignments, but they only have to pick one lab. This is true in some of our labs. Not everybody's bought into this. But they have to pick one lab and write a detailed lab report. But the first thing they have to turn in is a draft. And they're graded on the draft. And that gives the faculty an opportunity to say, well, move this around, talk about this here, give a proper introduction. And then they actually learn the qualities of writing a draft and producing a finished product. And we're still doing research on this, but we think this will help the students to learn better how to progress through a program and get better at writing, rather than just looking at writing as something that has to be done because it's got to be done by midnight and turned in. So uh, with that, uh, I will stop. Currently, we have 123 students in the program. We're planning to have a steady state of about 200 to 250. We've only graduated eight so far. That's the, the nature. You know, they, they come into the program. It takes a while, so that will start to come up. Uh, it's an engineering program. We just did a ABET uh, accreditation, and things are looking good there. But you're not allowed to say anything until it's signed, sealed, and delivered. So uh, we're currently also working on an accelerated five-year program, bachelor's to master's. And with that, I'll thank you. Hagen is of course going to be around, so you'll have a chance to speak to him during breaks and later on. Yeah, and to all if you want to ask him about questions. Okay, see you later. Uh, might be too early to be able to tell, but I mean, is there a, have you seen like a significant improvement in taking like word-based questions versus just straight physics and math questions? Is there an improvement in like, the retention of ideas or? I think it's too early to tell. It's actually, it's, it's often, it's, it, these things are often very subjective. It's, it's, it's hard, to, without actually doing uh, some pretty detailed research, it's hard to tell. You, you kind of want to have a control group where you do it one way and then another group where you do it the other way, and we, we, we really don't do that. Uh, so a lot of times it's, it's a subjective uh, thing. But I think subjectively that, that, that these techniques do work. But it's actually hard for professors because you've got to change the way you... Uh, you do things, and that's never easy. Because we're always in a hurry, as you know. Okay. I'm afraid we have to leave it at that. Uh, we're now going to do uh, a talk on five. Uh, five. Online. The floor is now at all in aerospace. And I think you graduated in the last couple of years. Yeah, two years ago. So, very recent. So, very recent graduate. Uh, Good to know. <laughs> All right. Um, so I am here to talk to probably a lot of the undergrad students about um, where I've gone in my career in the two years since I've left optical sciences. And so, hmm, we're having some interesting display issues. Um, so the reason that I'm here is that about eight years ago, I was sitting exactly where you are. I have an undergrad degree or almost in physics, electrical engineering, things like that. What are the next steps? Um, and the thing that I want to tell you was deciding to go into optics was definitely one of the best decisions I think that I could have made. So a little bit about me. I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. And probably like many of you, um, I had an early interest in science and math. My parents were, were into it. My elementary school science fair projects were about levers and pendulums. And I spent my time going to the Home Depot and building things in my garage. Um, I wasn't quite as ambitious as John Hayes polishing telescope mirrors, though I did get to that later. Um, so I decided to go to college and study physics, and I decided that moving to upstate New York sounded like a really good idea. Um, I went to Colgate University. I know there's a couple of people here there um, from there. So the moral of the story is I, I probably started off similarly to a lot of you with sort of this vague interest in science and math, not really knowing what, what kind of implications that might have later. 
So I went to Colgate University, um, took classes, participated in summer research. Um, I was also the president of the physics club, highly recommended activity. So here I am demonstrating a Rubens tube experiment we had set up in one of the labs. Um, and that was fantastic. But once you get to your junior, senior year, you're realizing you know, physics is a broad field. If I want to continue on in graduate school, I, I kind of need to narrow it down. You know, Mechanics has been solved. Am I interested in granular media? Am I interested in optics? So um, really, the answer to that question um, came for me in, in this. So, so what do a coffee cup and the Hubble Space Telescope have in common? Anybody know? Spherical aberration. Um, <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Tricked you there. Um, so basically, during my junior year, there was a department colloquium, and an alumni actually from both Colgate University and the College of Optical Sciences here at University of Arizona, um, Mitch Ruta, came to give a talk. And it was about optics, and specifically um, his work in diagnosing the spherical aberration in the Hubble Space Telescope. So as probably most of you know, they launched Hubble. Everyone was very excited. And when the first images came back, they were horrified at how blurry they were. It took quite a bit of time for them to diagnose what had gone wrong, but essentially that large primary mirror was made incorrectly. Um, it had what's an aberration called spherical aberration where the edges of the light didn't focus quite where they were supposed to. And you can kind of see it in a picture here like this. Uh, as it turns out, a sphere doesn't focus light very well, a parabola does. And so because they didn't get that edge shape quite right, all the images that they took were blurry. So now they had this extremely expensive space telescope that did not work as well as they said it was going to, and they had to figure out what to do. And so what they ended up doing was building something called COSTAR, Corrective Optics for Space Telescope Axial Replacement. And essentially what they did is they took light from the telescope and they funneled it into another instrument where they had a bunch of relay optics that essentially fixed this error and then spit the light back out into the rest of the instruments. And it turned out that that worked really great. Um, and so you can kind of see in this lower right-hand corner a picture of the before and after the CoStar replacement. Um, so this was really a pretty incredible feat of engineering, not only to do all of the diagnosis remotely, but also figure out how to implement it and ensure that it worked after launch, because that was obviously a very sensitive thing and NASA really needed to get it right. So during my senior year, um, I did research in Kiko Govez's optics lab. And his focus was really on quantum optics. So I did some experiments with measuring angular momentum of single photons. Um, but really, at that point, I was just playing with optics in the lab. Um, I hadn't really had the opportunity to work with that kind of hardware. Um, and so it was great to get that hands-on experience, you know, aligning different kinds of components, working with detectors, working with lasers. And so that was really my first introduction to optics. And I, I thought, hey, this, this stuff is really neat. I think I'll go to graduate school for optics. Um, and as you guys have heard over the last few days, there are a number of fantastic schools schools um, to study at. And really at that point, I thought that I was going to stay in AMO, Atomic Molecular Optical Physics. Um, so one of the places that I applied to was here at the University of Arizona. They had a visit weekend for accepted grad students. So I came out to check out the program. Um, as it turned out, that's where uh, this person that gave the colloquium that sort of started this, I mentioned he also went here to grad school, and so he told me I should come check it out. Um, and so I started my first year really with every intention um, of staying, as I said, in optical physics. Then I toured the mirror lab, which I believe you guys will have the opportunity to do this afternoon. And so um, over under the football stadium, there is a large facility for polishing 8.4 meter diameter mirrors. Most of them are primary mirrors for astronomical ground-based telescopes. Um, and so you go over there and you see that facility, and I thought, this is what I want to do. It's a little different maybe than what I thought, uh, but at that point I really wanted to switch gears. And so I started working for Jim Burge. This is a very um, good photo of him, but really this is probably more apt. And he was kind of, kind of a crazy guy. I learned a lot of really fantastic lessons from him, um, both technical and, and sort of life and career. And Jim actually retired this last semester, and so now Dewot Kim has taken over that group. So if any of the things I talk about here sound interesting to you, you should definitely connect with Dewok. All right, so moving on. You guys have heard so much about all of the research and all of the classes you can take, and all of that's true. Um, but kind of what was life like here at University of Arizona? Um, a big part of it was classes and homework. Um, so this is up on the eighth floor. We decided to uh, draw out the rectangular, cylindrical, and spherical coordinates on the windows, and they got mad at us and put signs up. But anyway, we got away with that for a week. Um, 
And then finally, um, up above, Jose Sassian is one of the um, optical engineering professors here. Um, he had a class that I took about my third year of grad school where we actually ground and polished our own telescope mirrors. So I did finally get to it. Um, my primary is only about four inches, and my secondary is about an inch. So it's, it's not going to take as amazing pictures as, as John's does. But, but that was a really fun way to kind of engage with optics in a hands-on way that's maybe a little different than, than what was going on in classes. Um, University of Arizona has an extremely involved student optics chapter, both through SPIE and OSA, which are the two major uh, societies for the optics uh, concentration. And so we did a lot of outreach events. That top picture is we're actually at the SPIE conference, Optics Photonics in San Diego, which takes place in August of every year. And we're doing a cow eye dissection <laughs> for different people, so that was fun. And then on the bottom was congressional visit days through OSA. So we actually got to go and meet with members of Congress and talk to them about current issues in optics um, and advocate for our industry. And so being able to have those kinds of experiences as a student and to have funding and financial support for that um, was a really great benefit in addition to all of the academic support. Um, also, it's really fun here. Um, we always had an off-site intramural soccer team. We actually did pretty well. Um, we had a lot of people that, that had played soccer, so we, we got first or second place most semesters, so that was really fun. Um, and then there's a lot of student organized activities. Um, this one here on the bottom is a camping trip that we took to the large binocular telescope on Mount Graham. Um, and so that actually, that telescope has two of those 8.4 meter diameter primary mirrors that I showed in the previous slide. And we actually got to go stand and, and look at them. And Dewok was on that trip, I believe. So that was, that was a lot of fun too. And the weather is really nice here. So in terms of the research that I did, um, I was in the Large Optics Fabrication and Testing, or LOFT group, and my thesis was Precision Alignment and Calibration of Complex Optical Systems. And I really, I'm not going to go into too much detail on these, I'm just going to kind of give you a flavor um, of what I did. One thing is I worked on the Hobby Eberly Telescope's Wide Field Corrector. So the Hobby Eberly Telescope is an 11 meter telescope that's at the McDonald Observatory in Texas. And it has, you can see in this picture on the left, um, a large primary mirror. However, it's segmented and it's spherical. And the reason they did that is it's significantly easier to produce a bunch of spherical segments than a bunch of A-spheres. The cost of this telescope is about a tenth of one of comparable size that had either a monolithic or A-spheric primary mirror. But as I mentioned with the Hubble Space Telescope, if you are trying to focus light with a sphere, it is not going to go very well. So it has this monstrous, what's called wide field corrector. And those are four approximately meter class optics that sit up at the top of the telescope. I don't know if there's a pointer here somewhere. I'm just gonna here. So they sit kind of up in this instrument package at the top of the telescope, and they provide all of that correction that that primary mirror puts in. And so the mirrors were actually fabricated and aligned here at the College of Optical Sciences. And I came up with the scheme to do that. And the basics of it is, there's something called computer-generated holograms, which are essentially fancy diffraction gratings. So it's a periodic structure that diffracts light into different patterns. And with CGHs, you can write very complex patterns very accurately, which essentially means you can get light to do almost, oh, thank you, almost whatever you want it to do. And so in this case, what we did is we designed CGHs that projected points of light to different places in the optical system. And by using cameras to see where those points of light were falling, you could align the optics very well. And one of the reasons for decoupling completely from the surfaces of these optics is, as I mentioned, these are doing the correction for that primary mirror. But if you look at the imaging just as a subsystem, it's terrible. You're trying to figure out, do I have the correct horrible looking spot and you just can't do it. So by mounting these optical references in the center hole of all of those mirrors, we could get extremely accurate alignment without even having to deal with any of those complex surfaces and those nasty looking spots. So it was, I really got to be involved in the design, um, the prototype testing, which is what's shown down here, and then a little bit in the alignment of the actual corrector. Another thing that I did um, is calibration for custom CGH-based interferometers. So you guys have heard a lot about interferometers. Um, commercial interferometers are great for measuring a variety of parts, but for some of the things that we were building here in the large optics group, we really needed a special configuration um, for quite a few different reasons. And so this is typically what one of our interferometers would look like. And so you have light coming out of a source, um, and you have a computer-generated hologram that's giving you essentially the wavefront shape that you need to compare an A-sphere to a sphere. And so here is that external cavity, so you'll have a reference surface and a test surface. 
And because the paths of light through all of these different optics are changing as you swap out CGHs and as you measure different things, you'll get all of these errors. And so basically what my thesis was is figuring out how to engineer those diffraction patterns in order to remove errors from these types of measurements. And we're talking there from maybe taking a measurement from 10, 20 nanometers RMS down to only a couple. So it's really about calibrating higher order effects um, in this kind of geometry. So again, I got to do the design and analysis, build the system, analyze the data. And then one of the last things I did was CGH alignment for testing astronomical primary mirrors. So this is a primary mirror segment for the Giant Magellan Telescope. If you guys go over to the mirror lab, I don't, do they have any GMT mirrors out right now? Oh, four's out, okay. Um, so this is um, a very large segmented telescope. So instead of a lot of those one meter hexagonal segments, this has 8.4 meter segments. And so in order to test um, one of these mirrors, you essentially need to have light that goes from the center of curvature, bounces off the mirror, and then comes back. But because this mirror is not a sphere, you have to have all of these auxiliary optics. And so as I mentioned, we have these diffractive elements that help you measure A spheres. You actually have to place them very accurately in the test, again, to avoid errors. So one of the topics that I did here was figuring out how to align all of these elements very accurately in space to maximize the accuracy of the test. And so again, the theme here is really that I was kind of using one optical device um, to measure A spheres in many different configurations, both for alignment um, and for calibration, and being able to walk through the life cycle of design, um, testing, and data analysis, I think really helped in my development as an engineer. Okay, so overall my experience here at OpSci is a, is a thumbs up. Um, there were absolutely fantastic classes um, I took more than the required course load, and there were still so many that I didn't get to. Um, you know, there's a lot of the core classes that give you a great foundation, and then there's a lot of elective classes that are just really fun and interesting um, and teach you a lot of extra skills and, and make you feel like you really do have a breadth of knowledge to take with you to the next place. Um, and then building on that research, I did a lot of very practical research. We had, we were building real optics for real customers. You know, I had to write technical memos for staff at other, at like the Hobby Eberly Telescope, make presentations to customers, give presentations at conferences. And so being able to have that kind of development in writing and presentation skills is also extremely valuable. Um, not to mention I got to contribute in some small way to uh, quite a few world-class ground-based observatories. And so now as science starts coming out of HET and GMT, I can kind of say, you know, yeah, I, I had a piece of that, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, also, the students, faculty, and staff here at, at Arizona are just fantastic. I can't say enough about um, how much fun it was and how this place really started to feel um, like home. So I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to come back and, and see more of that. And so really, I can't recommend this program highly enough, especially if you're interested in the optical engineering. I think that's a particular strength of this program. All right, so now that I've told you how wonderful graduate school is, you do eventually have to get a real job. Um, and here at Optical Sciences, they have something called the Industrial Affiliates Program, which I talked to, I, I don't know if that's something that they've talked about yet. Um, but the idea is that we hold a conference that's not completely dissimilar to this one about twice a year, where we bring in quite a few members of industry, students give presentations, they give presentations, and you can make a bunch of connections um, with potential bosses. And so I met my current boss my second year of graduate school and talked to him for four years. And so being able to build that relationship, when it came time to graduate, he looked at me and said, when are you starting? I really didn't have to job search. And at that point, um, other companies that I had gotten to know as well said, when are you starting with us? So I actually got five job offers without really doing any work. So that was nice. Um, ultimately, I chose Ball Aerospace, which is kind of funny because that's the company that built CoStar, which is that corrector for the, Hub the uh, Hubble Space Telescope that I talked about um, and kind of set me off on my optics career path before. So I'm just going to talk about some of the things I'm working um, on at Ball. So one of the main programs I'm on right now is the Operational Land Imager 2, and that is for NASA's Landsat program. So that's an Earth imaging satellite um, that's orbiting and collecting data of different kinds of land and ocean use. So this is what the instrument actually looks like. This is um, uh, OLI-2 is actually a rebuild of OLI-1. So that's OLI-1, the clean room at Ball. 
Um, and so what I'm working on is um, aligning the telescope. So it's that four mirror system right there. And so I've been in charge of doing the procurements, verifying all the testing. We're getting the hardware in right now. And so I'm in charge of setting up the testing equipment, doing the alignment, and verifying the performance. So that's a pretty decent sized, you know, a couple hundred million dollar program that I, you know, I'm a lead on one of the subsystems. So it's great to have that kind of opportunity. And the data that Landsat provides is something like you're seeing on the right. This is actually from uh, the earthquake in Nepal in 2015. Um, so the top is one of the images they took. It looks like it's from April of 2014. And then when that earthquake happened, they said, you know, we need to get some more data. We need to figure out for rescue operations, you know, where people are, where these major landslides are happening. And so Landsat data is not only helpful for kind of seeing what kind of trends are going on with our planet, but also disaster relief. Um, so it's, it's great to be able to contribute to that kind of an instrument. Um, I also just started working James Webb, which is pretty exciting. Um, so that's one of the NASA flagship missions. Um, it's an infrared space telescope that's launching in October of 2018. Uh, currently, the telescope and all the instrument modules are assembled, and they're at the clean room at Goddard Space Flight Center. And so I'm working on doing some of the ambient testing there. And then we're actually going to Houston Johnson Space Center, where they're going to put this in a giant cryovac chamber, which is actually the chamber that they use to test the Apollo landers, kind of a neat heritage. Um, and I'm supporting the ground testing there. And then finally, in order to get this mirror to fit in a rocket, you have to fold it up and then unfold it once it's on orbit. Um, but you need to get all of those individual 18 segments aligned to each other really well in order to do the science that they want. And so I'm actually on the team that's doing what's called the on-orbit commissioning. And basically that means that we're going to remotely align these 18 segments to about 5 nanometers while the telescope's a million miles away at L2. So that'll be a fun challenge. Um, and then finally, in addition to the big flight programs, I get to work some tech development, which is really fun. Um, so over here on the left is just a picture of what we're calling a compact hyperspectral um, spectrometer, imaging spectrometer. And so this is the kind of instrument that we might fly after OLI-2. So it's a land imager, meets a lot of the same requirements, um, and can provide that kind of data at a much smaller and cheaper package. Another thing I'm working on is coronagraph technologies for astrophysics. So for those of you who don't know, a coronagraph is a, um, an instrument that's used to measure dim objects around very bright objects. And so the idea there is if you have light from a planet and a star, if you can bring everything to focus and block just the light from the star, then the planet light makes it through and you can detect it. There are quite a few pretty complicated techniques in doing that efficiently. Um, but I'm working on building a test bed, working with some adaptive optics, um, and proving out essentially stability for coronagraph instruments. So it's, I can kind of do work at all levels, the big flight programs, and then also just getting in the lab and kind of running some things and, and testing out some concepts. So finally, my observations. Um, optics is an extremely diverse and exciting field, as you guys have been told for the last few days. Um, I've gone from quantum optics to large optics and then now to astrophysics instrumentation in less than a decade. And who knows what I'll be working on um, from here, so that's pretty exciting. Also, the University of Arizona at uh, Optical Sciences gave me a fantastic education, research experience, um, and connections that, lead me, that led me to the job um, that I have today. And finally, um, in case you guys haven't noticed from all the presenters, it's a very small optics world. A lot of people know each other. Um, and I, I kind of have a trace here that the Colgate alum that inspired me to go um, into optics went here for grad school. Um, here at grad school, I met people that led to my current job at Ball. Ball actually has a contract with Daywook. We also have contracts with my former advisor, Jim Burge. Um, and then I just talked to another friend at a conference earlier this week about putting together a NASA proposal. So this is a good place to sort of make all of those connections. Um, and it will, it will come in extremely valuable. So, thanks.